Now, for more on climate change, I'm joined by Alex Bosmoski. He's the Director of Strategy and Operations for RepublicN.org and the Energy and Enterprise Initiative at George Mason University. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Michelle. Now, we've seen recently that the U.S. seems to be hedging its bets when it comes to withdrawing out of the Paris Accords. What does this mean for the future of some of these internationally negotiated climate deals? We're not really sure. I don't think anyone really knows what the Trump administration's position is on the Paris Accord. Their bluster has been largely incoherent, and the reversals of that bluster have been just more rhetorical flourishes. We are not pulling out of the Paris Accord. That's a formal process that takes three years. The Trump administration seems to be saying we're going to take a back seat and maybe revise our emission reduction goals, because Paris is a voluntary, non-binding agreement. Countries come to the table and say, this is the best that we're, we can do, and we pledge to report our progress to the international community. For Trump to re-enter, as he says, the Paris Accords on terms more favorable to the United States, he would literally need to designate someone to get a napkin and a pen and write on uh, the napkin a new target for America and then take it to the mailroom and send it to the UN um, Framework Convention on Climate Change, and voila, we've renegotiated the Paris deal. But saying we're going to renegotiate the Paris deal by reconvening 195 countries to you know, redo it right. uh, is lunacy on stilts. So certainly uh, be taking this with a grain of salt. Um, now, we know that companies and individual states have decided, regardless of what the US does, they're going to stay committed to this. So how are companies preparing themselves and adapting to what they're seeing happening with climate change? OK. Firstly, lots of large corporations are adapting to the impacts of climate change. So if you're in the food business or the tourism business or you own real estate or you sell insurance, you are adapting to the impacts of climate change. And the, those adaptations, the cost of it, are being reflected in the prices for consumers. But all corporations have to deal with the liability that is their carbon emissions. And corporations are dealing with that in a few different ways I can think of. First is the direct procurement of renewable energy. So something like 13% of Fortune 100 companies have procurement or have uh, power purchase agreements to buy renewable energy directly. 63% have renewable uh, sustainability targets, and 106 major multinational companies have committed to buy 100% of their power from renewable sources. Another thing corporations are doing is greening the supply chain. So Apple's got a two gigawatt clean energy investment in China to green their supply chain. Walmart is taking a billion tons of CO2 out of their supply chain. And the third thing is by adding a price on carbon to your internal calculus of the return on investment for projects. So companies have a shadow carbon tax right. that they use to make sure that their projects and investments will be profitable in a carbon constrained world, because that's where we're headed. So certainly building it into their corporate strategy. Um, now, if, as we take a look at the individual renewable energy sources, which ones are seeing the most growth and which ones are seeing some challenges? Well, solar and wind continue to grow rapidly. Um, modern renewables are growing at about 4.5% per year, which is about double the pace of the um, global energy consumption growth. Um, but we're still at really low levels um, globally in terms of renewable electricity supply. Uh, but solar and wind are growing rapidly. China added 50% more solar last year and almost 50% more wind. And just quickly, as we look at some of these countries that were really dependent on commodities, oil-rich countries like Saudi Arabia, how are they adapting to what's happening? Are they perhaps digging their heels in, or are they also exploring more of these renewable sources? Well, one thing you see from those countries is they're certainly trying to use less of their uh, fossil fuels at home and so that they can benefit from the foreign exchange of selling them. So you see rapid renewable energy deployments in fossil fuel um, extracting countries because they want to sell those fossil fuels and not just consume them at home with subsidized gasoline or free oil. And just quickly, as we look at some of the, the holistic view, is this does seem to be a, a team effort. It doesn't really do much good if a lot of countries are holding back while others are really trying to push ahead with this. An ideal policy to have in place that would help businesses and governments really promote pushing more work in this, in this area, what would you suggest? The best way to reduce 
carbon emissions in an economically efficient manner is a transparent tax on carbon emissions. Um, and the most pro-growth way to do that is to recycle the revenue from taxing pollution into tax cuts for things that we want more of, like income, investment, jobs. Well, thank you so much for your insight. Great to have you on. Alex Bozmarski, Director of Strategy and Operations for RepublicN.org and the Energy and Enterprise Initiative at George Mason University.